God didn't fail to bring in the kingdom through the Hebrew nation of Israel. So the result of the Old Testament isn't, okay, that was a failure, so now the church is plan B. That's so far from the truth. They're two entirely and separate, different entities. And this lesson is designed to show you it wasn't a failure. We just see prophetically uh, timelines. So 1 Samuel chapter number 8, let's start reading in verse number 4. The Bible says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah. And said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. What did the people want? They wanted a king like all of the other nations. A king, a king, a king. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they had rejected me, that I should not reign over them. We got a lot of lessons here. Number one, don't take it personal if someone rejects you when you try to give them the gospel. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the salvation offered to them from the Lord. They're rejecting the Lord. And the same problem, the same issue here. The people didn't like what they had, what God reigning over them. So they wanted a king like all of the other nations. Verse number eight. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. There's a leadership lesson here. We need to do what God and uh, Samuel did, which is we have to be ready to deal with people's difficult choices. People become difficult by the choices that they make. And the people were making a poor choice. God and Samuel dealt with it. We find out God gave them what they wanted. Look at verse number 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us. Didn't want to hearken unto Samuel. We may also be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Sad news. God gives them what they want. Sadder news. Man's ideas typically fail. <laughs> and it's a good example here. And so what happened? Well, Saul is anointed the first king of Israel. And how'd that turn out? Not so great. Not so great. Wasn't a great idea. So then what happens? Uh, David is anointed king. The second king of Israel. And Isbosheth had a two-year stint where David was reigning over Judah and then uh, eventually reigning over all of Israel. And then from there you have Solomon. And then next you have Rehoboam. And what happens under Rehoboam's kingship? The kingdom was divided. And so you've now you've got Judah, you've got Israel, you've got north and south. You've got 19 kings in one. You've got 20 kings in another. And most of them did evil in the sight of the Lord. Matter of fact, in Israel, the nine, out of the 19 kings, only Jehu, he was the only king who did right some of the time, but not 100% all the time. Judah, much, a little bit better. He had six that did right. Asa, Jehoshaphat, Uzziah, Jotham, Hezekiah, and Josiah. He had two, in that, two out of that 20 that were a mixed bag like Jehu. They did right sometimes, but they did evil quite often. So what do you have? A nation that didn't want to be ruled by God. So they said, give me a king like the other nations. And so God gave them what they want. But all their idolatry, all their rebellion. What is God ends up disassociating, disassociating himself with that nation. 
and with those kings. And we're going to see that. Before we see that, go back to Exodus chapter number 13. And let's look at verse number 20. Exodus chapter number 13. And we see in verse number 20, and they took their journey from Succoth and encamped in Ethan in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. You know, those, uh, the, those pillars of cloud and fire. It was guidance and assurance that God's power would protect them. That was a manifestation that that nation saw, a manifestation of the glory of God right before their eyes. Exodus chapter number 24. Let's get another picture. Exodus 24. Look at verse number 16. Verse 15, and Moses went up the mountain, up the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And in the sight of the glory of the Lord, it was like devouring fire on top of the mountain, the eyes of the children of Israel. Wow. Cloud covering it, fire, like fire devouring it. Another manifestation that those people of Israel saw of the glory of God. It's wonderful. Until you get to Exodus 32 and they're making a golden calf that's lifeless. After all they saw. Now we know in Psalm 19, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. And you can look out in God's creation and see his glory. We're not talking about that in this specific message or these verses. We're talking about visible, physical manifestations outside of God's creation where he shows his glory. Let's go in our Bible to the book of Ezekiel. We're going to spend some time there. We'll open up in Ezekiel chapter number 8. We're going to see God taking the manifestations of his glory and leaving his temple. Ezekiel chapter number eight. We see in verse number four. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there. Where? The Ark of the Covenant inside Solomon's temple. That's where. <laughs> go, go to Ezekiel chapter number nine. So it's there. It's in the temple. Watch Ezekiel chapter number nine, verse number three. Ezekiel nine, verse number three. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. And set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And let me draw your attention to verse number three. Going from the cherub whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. What are we seeing? We are seeing a physical manifestation of God's glory and he's moving it. It was in the temple, the cherub. Now it's going to the threshold. We all know that's associated with the doorway. And we see this progression through Ezekiel where God is removing his glory. Look at Ezekiel chapter number 10, verse number 18. Ezekiel 10, verse number 18. The Bible says, then the glory of the Lord departed from off the fresh threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. Where does it go? From inside the temple, from the cherubims, where? To the threshold of the door. Now where? Outside of the threshold. And outside of the temple. Verse number 19. And the cherubim lifted up their wings. 
and mounted up from the earth in my sight. When they went out, the wheels also were beside them, and everyone that stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was over and above them. This is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river of Chebar, and I knew that they were the cherubim. He's left the threshold. It was supposed to be a house that was built for his name. Now tell me that's not this modern Laodicean church age application we can easily make here. It's supposed to be the church house. It's supposed to be where the Lord dwells within his people and his saints. We can just go right on down the line, story after story, of just seeing how all of this mess is unfolding within American so-called Christianity. It's just become a hot mess. What's happening? Right before the prophet's eyes is glory's leaving. He's taken it out of the temple. There's a pause. Verse number 19 it was in the temple, then it was at the threshold, and it's outside of the threshold, outside of the temple. And now we see at the end of verse number, in the middle of verse number 19, it says, And everyone stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house. And he pauses right over the eastern gate for everybody to see. And it seems to me in Ezekiel. God just took the whole Ark of the Covenant, just removed it, brought it up to his throne. That's what it seems like to me. But we do know his glory. We can see the progression of it leaving. Ezekiel chapter number 11. Look at verse 22. Ezekiel 11, verse 22. Then did the cherubims lift up their wings. And the wheels beside them. And the glory, here it is, of the God of Israel was over them above. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. God's glory is gone. It is completely and officially left the temple. It passes over the Kidron Valley, which is basically the divider. It's right in between. Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives, and it's gone. It's gone. It's, and it stood right over, right over that Mount of Olives. Why is all that important? Go to Ezekiel 21, and we'll start to get this understanding. Ezekiel chapter number 21. None of these kings ruled. The whole, the whole idea of the kings, most of them did what was evil. God said one thing, the people had another idea. They got themselves in trouble. And so God, he's, all their wickedness, all their rebellion, all their idolatry, God's fed up. So he's taking his glory and he's leaving. Ezekiel 21, look at verse number 18. Ezekiel 21, verse 18. The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, Man, Ezekiel saw some powerful things, didn't he? Also, thou son of man, appoint thee two ways, that the sword of the king of Babylon may come. Both twain shall come forth out of one land, and choose thou a place. Choose it at the head of the way to the city. Appoint a way that the sword may come to Rabbath of the Amorites and to Judah in Jerusalem, the defense. For the king of Babylon stood at the parting of the way at the head of the two ways to use divination. He made his arrows bright. He consulted with images. He looked in the liver. Well, that's a weird verse. What is it to look in the liver? Anybody ever look in the liver? 
It's divination. It's a form of divination. The entire nation is overcome with some type of idolatry. I'll look in the liver. Yeah. They would judge the success or failure by looking at the entrails of the sacrifice that they made and specifically the liver. And if it was healthy, it was a good omen. If the liver wasn't healthy, healthy, they considered it a failure and a bad omen, divination, and God's fed up, fed up. It used to be called hepatoscopy, where they believed that the liver, it was this belief that the liver had some significance. So what hepatoscopy did was they gave the liver zones. And guess what each zone of that liver was associated with? A pagan deity. A pagan deity. Let's keep reading. Verse number 22. At his right hand was the divination for Jerusalem. To appoint captains. To open the mouth in slaughter. To lift up the voice with shouting. To appoint battering rams against the gate. To cast a mount and to build a fort. And it shall be unto them as a false divination in their sight. To them that have sworn oaths. But he will call to remembrance the iniquity that they may be taken. The last verse. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you have made your iniquity to be remembered and that your transgressions are discovered so that in all your doings, your sins do appear. Because I say that ye are come to remembrance. ye shall be taken with the hand. What's that mean? They're going to be delivered into the hand of the Babylonians. And they're taken into Babylonian captivity. How'd the whole idea of kingship go? There's only one king that can do it right. Look at verse number 25. And thou profane wicked prince of Israel. Well, Zedekiah is the last king. Back in Job, it says, is it fit to say to a king, thou art wicked? And to princes, ye are ungodly? Yes, if it's Zedekiah, <laughs> you bet it is. And that prophet Ezekiel saying it, saying it in the name of the Lord. Zedekiah was the last king of Judah. Did evil in the sight of the Lord. That last king. And in verse number 24, in Ezekiel 21, ye shall be taken with the hand, and they're delivered into the hand of the Babylonians. You know who Zedekiah was the son of? Josiah. Which goes to show, you are not getting in because of daddy's righteousness. Josiah was a good king, one of few good kings that did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. His son was wicked. His son's wicked. Verse 25. Is that where we're at, I believe? Yep, end of verse 25. Whose day has come when iniquity Shall have an end. Now watch this. Verse 26. Thus saith the Lord God. Remove the diadem. And take off the crown. God removes the crown. From the kings of Israel. And nobody. Nobody's getting a crown. Because the kingdoms down here. They ain't running them right. And God says, I'm so fed up with the nation. I'm taking my glory out of the temple. I'm leaving my glory. And guess what? Nobody's getting anointed king. Remove the diadem and take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. That crown is not going to go on top of another Hebrew king's head 
until King Jesus is crowned. Nobody's wearing a crown. When Jesus comes back his second time, he's going to be King Jesus wearing the crown. God the Father's going to place it on his son. Praise God for King Jesus. Bible says in Daniel 2, we used this verse the other week. He removeth kings and he setteth up kings. And you know what God's going to do? We saw what he did. You know what he did in the Old Testament? He took the crown from one head and he removed it and he put it on another head. And he removed that one and he put it on another head. And he removed that one and he put it on another head. Why? Because God is giving the kingship and he can remove it at any time. And that's exactly what he did. It is ordered. It was ordered by God. It was ordered by God. Twenty six. Uh, verse twenty seven and the last verse here, and I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it to him. See that? And now, son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God concerning the Amorites and concerning the reproach. Even say thou, the sword, the sword is drawn. For the slaughter it is furnished to consume because of the glittering. Whiles they see vanity unto thee, whiles they divine a lie unto thee, to bring thee upon the necks of them that are slain of the wicked, whose day is come when their iniquity shall have an end. What I want you to get out of it, verse 27, is this. Who's right it is, and I will give it him. God the Father is going to give the crown to King Jesus when he comes back. So what do we have? We're talking about the kingdom of heaven. This is this physical kingdom. We introduced that last week. So we're not going to review that material. God sets up kings, sets up kingdoms, removes kings, removes kingdoms. And all that the nation has been through, all the physical manifestations of God's glory that he has shown them and protected them with. Now they want a king. They give them a king. And we see how that all ends with God removing his glory, removing the crown. And it's not going to go on the top of any Hebrew king's head until Jesus comes back. Now, we got all that, right? We got through Ezekiel. And we understood some. There's <laughs> a lot of stuff in there. Now, let's fast forward 600 years. Okay? Luke chapter number one. Luke chapter number one. It's about 600 years later. And let's go Luke chapter one, verse number 26. Luke chapter number one, verse number 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. The angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. When she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. 600 years later, after God took his glory out of the temple and removed it, it shows back up again in a physical manifestation of a body of flesh, Jesus Christ. And his glory is veiled by the body of flesh 
that we know as the Lord Jesus Christ. And, it, and the glory is back. But it's covered. It's veiled. But you've got the glory of God showing up on earth. And what does it say? The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. What else does it say? And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. That's the ruling king. We see it. The whole deal with kings didn't work out. But it's going to. And watch what it says. And his kingdom, there shall be no end. Now, the first time he came to die as the suffering servant, as a sacrificial lamb. We all get that, right? But in that proclamation, what else is declared as true? Well, we all we, we already read it, but he's going to set up an everlasting what? Kingdom. Kingdom. That is a physical kingdom. The kingdom of heaven. That's the physical kingdom. And he is going to be given what a king is given. Oh. And that throne is going to be on Mount Zion and that Hebrew lineage. All of that lineage from Abraham will be ruled by the law of Moses. Mosaic law. It's not now. It's not when Jesus walked his earthly ministry. But we see the declaration of that. In the announcement made in Luke chapter number one. What happened in Luke two? Go over there. Watch this. Luke chapter two. And he came by the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law. His parents bring him to the temple. Look at verse number 32. Watch what it says. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people, Israel. Look at verse 46. And when they found him not, that's his parents, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple. Guess what he was doing? Sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them. And asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. Why? You've got the king of glory. Who isn't crowned king yet. But it's the glory of God manifest in the body of flesh. And all those doctors and every single one of them are absolutely astonished. The glory's back. The glory's back. At least physically manifested. Now, let's fast forward about 30 years, shall we? Let's go 30 years forward. Go to Matthew 3. Matthew chapter number 3. Watch what it says. In those days... Came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All you that love John the Baptist, great, love John the Baptist, but you're not going to go out into the wilderness and preach what John the Baptist preached. Why? Because we are not preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. You can go back and get that message on the rightly dividing series. It talks about the different gospels that were preached. But for the sake of tonight, let's move onward and upward. Verse number three, because this is, an, this is a key voice, a verse. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the kingdom, make his path straight. Except it doesn't say prepare ye the way of the kingdom, does it? It says, prepare ye the way of the Lord. So you got a couple of things happening in these two verses. You have at the same, what's at hand? 
the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What is prepared? The way of the kingdom? No. He's at hand. He's on the scene, but he's not setting up a kingdom. That's why it says, prepare you the way of the Lord. The Lord is on, on the scene. You can't prepare you the way of the kingdom when Jesus Christ is on the scene. Because you can't have a kingdom unless you have a king. Hence the term kingdom. He didn't come to set up his kingdom that first time. Jesus Christ didn't come to sit on a throne. You know what he came to do? Hang on a tree. But just like we saw in Luke chapter number one, what was declared at that announcement of his birth? Some prophetic things that are going to happen. But right now, we have in Matthew chapter number three, prepare ye the way of the Lord. None of the kingdom of heaven promises will be fulfilled until Christ comes back his second time. And when he comes back his second time, there isn't going to be any new information. It is going to be the fulfillment of everything that we've been reading and studying about. Make sense? Matthew 4, watch this. We see it again in verse 17. Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Look at Matthew. Why is he saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Because he's at hand. He's on the, Jesus Christ is on the scene. He's on the earth. Look at Matthew 10. Matthew chapter 10. It's somewhere in here. Matthew chapter 10. Okay, verse number 7. And as you go... Uh, so he said, well, look at verse number five, these 12, Jesus sent forth and commanded them saying, and now look at verse number seven, as you go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I think he makes reference to it. One more spot, in Matthew chapter number 10. So Jesus is preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand and he commissioned and he commanded the apostles to preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why? He's on the scene. When the New Testament opens up with this announcement that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it is not because Jesus Christ is now ready on earth to set up an earthly, literal, physical kingdom that is not why the new testament opens up with these types of announcements jesus is on the scene and it's an, an announcement that he is the only one that can and will restore what adam lost what did adam Lose dominion of a kingdom. And we talked about that last week. Genesis 3, the fall. What happened? Adam dropped the ball. The dominion given to him by God was now picked up by Satan. And Jesus' announcement that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he's here. He's not, the announcement is not that he is there to set up a kingdom, although they wanted him to. It is that he, he is and will be the only one that will restore what Adam lost. All of Adam's seed is corrupted by sin. And nothing is going to fix this kingdom down here on earth. I don't care how many peace marches they have. I don't care how many political rallies they have. 
I don't care how many stadiums they can fill with this political candidate is going to be the solution for our kingdom down here on earth. They will all fail. Why? Because with the best candidate, you still have what we still have, even after the best sermon that you've listened to or the best sermon that I've listened to or the best church service that we walk out of, you know what we still have after all that's done? An earthly, physical kingdom that's ruled by who? Satan. Satan. And Jesus Christ is the only one that has the power to take it back. The first Adam dropped the ball. The second Adam is going to pick it up. Praise God when someone gets saved. But guess who still controls this world? Praise God that we're going to go out this weekend and we're going to witness to a bunch of folks and we're going to give them the good news of the gospel and it's going to be great. And if one or two or three get saved, praise God, hallelujah. But guess who's still going to be ruling this world? Yeah, that's right. Temporarily, right now, he is still in control of the kingdoms of this world. And guess what happened to all those Old Testament kings? One came and went. Another came and went. And as they came and went, guess who was still in control of this world? Not the next king, Satan. He's the prince. He's the king. And Jesus Christ is the only one that will restore power to the kingdom. It was ruined by Adam's fall. And yes, Jesus is the king of the Jews, but he was virgin born, like we read in Luke chapter number one. And he's not going to have a corrupted seed. We have a corrupted seed. All the previous kings in the Old Testament had a corrupted seed, but not Jesus Christ. Now, we'll close with this. Kingdom of God in the book of Luke alone is mentioned 33 times. And just like we talk about Israel and the church, not the same two different entities, it brings into light even a better understanding when we understand the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are two distinct things. Kingdom of heaven, physical. Next Thursday, we're going to get into the kingdom of God, which is within, which is spiritual. We'll be looking at that. Um, there was a small window of time during Jesus's earthly ministry when he mentions both are at hand. Because that small window of time, God's glory came back down, veiled by a body of flesh. And he could rightly say, yeah, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So is the kingdom of God. I'm it. <laughs> I am it. I am going to be crown king of the physical kingdom. It's mine. The father is given temporary control. The kingdom of God, well, he's always ruled that. So next Thursday, Lord willing, we'll talk about the spiritual kingdom of God.